How do we lead up? How do we lead to a place where someone would give me the single most important piece of their business to run and be someone who <clears throat> hopefully had influence to change that? So hopefully this is good. I'm going to speak fast and hopefully tell a couple of stories that may make this sticky so that we can get through this. But um, there's a paradox in, our, in the world we live in. And that paradox is this, that the reward to great work is more work. I mean, it's this weird thing that we live in in sort of the Western American culture. Like, if you do great work, you're going to get more work. And that's really, as weird as it sounds, I think there's a sublime uh, sort of hope that you're here going, how do I get more work? And you're, you may not think of it as more work because you're like, I'm already overloaded with my plate. But here's why I think that's important to know. More work means more opportunity. And more opportunity means more chances to grow your influence and ultimately figure out a way to lead. So I got a couple of thoughts here I just want to share. Uh, you may want to write some of these down. Number one. If you're going to be someone who tries to gain influence up, we've first got to become an owner. Now, I didn't know this at the time when I <clears throat> was working for Greg, uh, this whole idea of becoming an owner, but I started teaching myself to think like an owner. I mean, he was an owner of the company, and I watched the way he worked, and I watched that he never used the phrase, that's not my job. I mean, I never saw him with a client. I never saw him with any of the other people who had come in for some of our events and use that phrase, that's not my job, because as an owner everything's ultimately your job. It may not be your job, like your J-O-B on your job description, but if you think like an owner, it is your responsibility. You know, I can't, I'm the owner of Orange Thread Media, so I can't walk into my team and say, hey, that's not my job to pick up the trash. Hey, that's not my job to do this. I have so many other things I've got to take care of, right? I can't get away with that. And so I've got to have that mentality of saying, it may not be my job, but it is my responsibility, and I still have to take care of that. And that's the first thing. I would say there's a great story I've been reading if, if you're into wanting to become a great leader, there's a book I recommend called Extreme Ownership. Um, I don't know if anybody's reading that book right now, but a guy named Jocko Willink and Leif Babin have been, wrote this book, and it's just incredible. It's basically the story of him, Leif, and Jocko on their uh, journey of being a U.S. Navy SEAL, and in their process of being SEALs, all the leadership lessons that they pulled out. He opens the book up with a powerful story that I want to re retell here in just a second. So <clears throat> he and his seals were fighting in Iraq, Ramadi, Iraq, actually, and they were fighting against ISIS. And one of the things that was interesting about this whole book is that he's helping you understand that in order to fight ISIS, they actually had to partner up with the Iraqi soldiers. A lot of that was because of the politics that were going on here in the States. They couldn't send a lot of the, the sort of troops overseas. But in doing so, it sort of made it really difficult for the SEALs sometimes to identify the differences between an Iraqi soldier and what they called the Muj, or the um, uh, Muslim insurgents, as they called them, Muj, in the book. And so he tells this great story of the Navy SEALs were sent out to this one community, and they climbed up in this tower, and the, the American sort of strategy is sort of take your place and wait for the Muj to appear, and then you can attack and, and win the battle. And so they went up on this high place, Navy SEALs are snipers, right? And so they went up on this place and then the Iraqi soldiers went out to their place and they just sort of chilled, they waited. And late in the afternoon, some gunfire erupts and both of these parties begin to find themselves in a heated battle. The Navy SEALs call for backup. They call back to the base and they say, hey, we need some backup. And so they send some backup and then a couple you know, minutes later, they learn that the Iraqi soldiers also need backup. And so Jocko Willink, who's the commander of this entire brigade, he basically comes in and says, hold on, this doesn't make sense. How is it that both of these guys are under heavy artillery attack right now? So he makes his way to the battle scene. He goes to the Navy SEALs first and he sees the place and he's like, okay, interesting. He comes back and slowly makes his way around to where the Iraqi soldier is. And when he gets to where the Iraqi soldiers are, he starts realizing something's not right. This doesn't seem like this is the Muj that we're fighting. This seems like this is our own people. And they come to learn that it's blue on blue, as they call it, basically friendly fire. The Iraqi soldiers are basically in combat with the Navy SEALs. And so you can imagine the anger that Jocko has. Jocko comes back and he puts a cease and desist on all you know, military and basically says, okay, let's all head back to the, ba the base and after dinner, I want every man who's been in, in this battle to report in our mess hall. We're gonna, ha we're gonna figure out whose fault it is. Oh, can you imagine like gut check and going, oh no, what's gonna happen, right? So they go eat dinner. I'm sure that meal, not many people ate. They came back, they all get <clears throat> in this room and Jocko just says, men, what happened today is unacceptable and I'm not leaving this place until we know whose fault this is. 
So the way he tells the story is that a guy raised his hand, the radio man, basically the guy who was in charge of, you know, sending the radio signals to and from me and said, you know, sir, this is my fault. I was the one that spoke up. I shouldn't have spoke up first. If it weren't for me, this thing wouldn't happen. He goes, no, it wasn't your fault. Appreciate that, young man. You can take a seat. Whose fault was this, men? So the first sniper now stands up, and he's like, well, if it wasn't his fault, I guess it's my fault, right? I was the first one to shoot. If I had never shot, we wouldn't be in this place. And he, Jocko cuts him off. No, it wasn't your fault either. Whose fault was this, man? There's only one person to blame. So everybody gets real quiet. He, he goes, I'll tell you whose fault it is. It's my fault. It's my fault because I lead your brigade, and it is my responsibility to make sure that communication is passed down this ranks so that everyone knows what's happening. Well, here's what's crazy about that story. Jocko was willing to take 100% ownership of this failure, even though he was never on the battlefield, except for those few minutes when he was checking in on the heavy artillery backup that each team asked. But he talked about how the two men who stood up and said it was my fault, how much respect he had for him, because they were willing to take responsibility for the whole thing. 